Praise the Lord. Amen. Brethren, this morning our pastor is not here. He has asked us to lead the service this morning. So with the help of the Lord, we're going to have a good service. Pray for Brother Henry as he's in Montreal. Thank the Lord that the work of God is moving, that he is, the Lord is moving over this world. Before we get into our service, before we get have the children come up and sing, I would like to share a scripture with you that has blessed my soul. So Revelation chapter 19 in verse... Um, Oh, what is it? Verse number five, it says, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I was thinking, what is the scripture saying? Why are we praising our God? And if you read Revelation 18, it talks about how he hath judged that great whore, that great wicked system that is ruling over this world, that he has ju judged and avenged our blood on her. And anyway, it talks about Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. And brethren, that is a reason to rejoice this morning, that this system that is oppressing humanity, that that system is finally being judged by the kingdom, by God's people in this time. And I think it's just beautiful that the apostles can go out. Brother Henry can be in Montreal. And just the, anyway, I just think it's beautiful. So let's praise the Lord this morning, and we'll have the children come up and sing. Amen. Amen. Boy, they did. 
Let's sing. Only boy named David. Everybody get your slings ready, your stones ready. Only a boy named David. Only a little stone. Only a boy named David. I need the prince.
you gonna hold it? Do you want to stand up here so people can see it? You know, you want to stand up there? Okay, you're pretty good. All right. Oh, yes, the best day in my life I ever did. Oh, yes, the best day in my life. Feel like 
traveling on, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair, I feel like traveling on. The Lord has been so good to me, I feel like traveling on. Until that blessed home I see, I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair, I feel like traveling on. Yes. 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 You know, saints, the Bible says Enoch walked with God yes. 300 yes. years. Right. Brother Peter, he must have enjoyed it because yes. he would not have walking for 300 years if it had not been a joy to right. him. Right. 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 Uh, we're, right. we're singing, I feel like traveling on. One mm. child's rendition of Enoch's story was, and they walked, and they walked, and they walked, until one day they walked and the Lord said to Enoch, now Enoch, you don't need to go home today. You're coming home with me. Mm. And since I just feel like walking on, Amen. walking Amen. on. As we walk and we talk about heaven, yes. we are going to make it. We're going to help yes. one another. Yes. We're going to be strong. Yes. We're going to become <laughs> more and more godly because the yes. closer you walk with him, the more, the sweeter, the, the, the purer you become. And yes. that's yes. my desire, just yes. to walk close yes. to yes. the Lord my God. Yes. 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 459. 459. Have we any hope within us of a life beyond the grave in the sweet and vernal name? Do we know in this our tabernacle were to be dissolved with a house not made with hands? We have a home within our souls, brighter than the perfect day.
kingdom we have now within us is peace, it is comfort and joy, and the hope in our blessed Redeemer, which the tempter can never destroy. When we get home, we'll shout and sing. Sing this morning, I feel like traveling on. Yes. 
The other song says, not made with hands. When we get home. And all those songs, the people are trying to express the feelings or could we say the lack of feelings. We Sometimes we feel like not doing anything. And sometimes we feel pain and sometimes we feel uncomfortable. And then... They're saying, when we get home, we won't have that anymore. We're not going to have the problem of, of when we come to service that, I don't know, I don't feel it. Or, I don't know, I don't feel like doing anything. We're going to sing. We're going to have the feelings to do to do it. We're not, we're not going to have to push ourselves, but it's going to come naturally. We're going to want to do it. We're not going to be able to hold ourselves back from doing it. And I say this morning over here, maybe if we were able to get rid of our, our push our flesh under our feet a little more, maybe if you were to put some feet to, you, to what to the lack of feeling, so to say, maybe then the feelings would come that would push you to doing what you don't feel like doing right now. Oftentimes, I I like to very much like to compare working out to the life of a Christian. So often, so often you don't feel like doing it. You don't feel like getting up. You don't feel like push, pushing forward. But just start. Don't go once you feel like doing it. But start and the feelings will come after. So let's, let's support the preacher this morning. Let's have a good service. If, if you came here this morning expecting to be blessed... There, the, the chances are you won't be blessed. But if you came here this morning expecting to help, expecting to be a blessing, the chances are you will be blessed. Let's go to prayer.
Please be seated. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. I am so thankful to be with the Assembly of the Saints today. God has a people in this time. And we know we need the Lord. We need the Lord in a great way. So we need these assemblies. We really do. We need to be together. I want to welcome this morning the online audience. Wish you could be here in person. There's nothing like it. <laughs> But we're glad you could at least be online. May God bless you, each one. And please turn with me this morning to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, and pray for the word of God, brother. Amen. Willie, that was a wonderful exhortation. Yes. And we all need it. Yes. Isaiah 6, can I have help with the reader this morning, please? Brother Andrew, we're going to start in verse 1. <clears throat> Actually, just read, well, yes, read down to verse 4, please. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5 as well, please. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Thank you, brother. Isaiah, in the younger years of his prophetic ministry, had this tremendous vision. And he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. His train or his robe filled the temple. And we see the things going on there and the voice crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice. And Isaiah was there he was a man, he was human, just like you and I are human. Maybe he didn't feel special, like many times we don't feel special. Just felt ordinary. And all of a sudden, whatever day this was, whatever he was doing, God broke in upon him with a divine vision of himself in his power and in his glory. We kind of skip through the scriptures, don't we? We kind of just glance on them and we go on and we don't really stop and think. Put yourself in that position to see such a thing, to feel such a thing, to hear such voices, to see that the effect was so tremendous that the posts of the door actually moved. They moved. And Hosea took that all in as best as a human could. And he said, Woe is me. I'm undone. Because he knew he was in the presence of God. And that God had favored him with such a divine visitation and such a divine vision. 
you know, different ones over the course of history have experienced similar things, supernatural things. Even to this day, God is doing things like that. Speaking to his servants, calling his servants in divine ways. And it's a wonder and it's a marvel. And when you have something like that happen, you never forget it. You never lose the sense of that sacredness, of the wonder of it, of the amazingness of it. And it humbles you to think that God would communicate with you in such a way. And as a prophet, how much needed is to have such a vision. To know whom they're dealing with. To keep that with them. Because you will not forget it. All through their ministerial years. I cannot recall offhand, maybe somebody knows, how many years Isaiah prophesied. I believe it was a long time. But he needed this. Because... Prophets need courage. I'm telling you, prophets need courage. And so do prophetesses. <laughs> they need courage, sister. The troubles come. They're real. They're hard. They're difficult. But you've got to go through it. Some way or another, you've got to go through it. And we see this in the younger part again of his ministry. Let's go now to Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. <clears throat> I want verse 15. But before you read, this is probably at least 40 years since the time of his first vision. At least 40 years would be my guess. And if you know the history of the Israelites, it's not good. To a large degree, they did not do well. They were very prone to fall into the idolatry of the heathen nations around them, which eventually culminated in the wrath of God because they would not listen to the prophets. They would not straighten up. And we find in this chapter that they're dealing with the same situation. They're in the middle of it. So please read verse 15 of chapter 57. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Thank you, brother. Do you see his first vision in these declarations here? Still before him, high and lifted up God before his view as he speaks to the people, trying to communicate to the people what he sensed, what he felt, what he lived and breathed, in his own experience. Don't you know who God is? You fellow Israelites, you fellow Jews who have been so favored, don't you know by now? He's the high and lofty one. High and lifted up that inhabits eternity. That's who we're dealing with. I dwell in the high and holy place. He inhabits eternity. What kind of being inhabits eternity? For one thing, it's none but God. It's none but God. 
And besides him, there is no other. There's only one God. And it's the God in the Bible. It's the God we're talking about this morning. He inhabits eternity. Now that's an amazing word. That's an amazing concept. Eternity. Do you ever think about eternity? No beginning, no end. And God has always inhabited eternity. We have to deal with eternity. I want you to think about eternity. We don't think deeply enough. We have all been, we have all been victims of the last, I'm going to even say from the beginning of my life. We've been dumbed down. I, I was brought up, I was born in the 50s and I was brought up from my youngest memories I remember watching television, which was rather new to the homes at the time. Now, we were a poor family, and yet we had a television. And it's amazing, because back in those days, people didn't have the wealth that they generally do today. They didn't. They didn't have a lot of restaurants. You didn't even think about going out to eat, let alone taking a family to go out to eat. And people used to have families, you know. And it wasn't 1.5 children or 2.5 children, whatever that is. So from very young, I was watching television. I was watching the Beverly Hillbillies, and I was watching Bewitched. I know I'm aging myself, but that's okay. <laughs> this gives it away anyway. <laughs> Besides, I don't mind my age one little bit. I thank God for every year. I'm comfortable being the age that I am. I don't wish to be younger. I don't wish my hair was back to its natural color. I don't wish for any of it. I'm happy to be 67. But we listened, we watched, and we absorbed like sponges. But what we didn't realize, that there's people that are behind these, these inventions. Yes. Right. That major in propaganda. Yeah. Right. They do. Yeah. And they've been doing it when I was little. I had no idea. Right. Right. But they were, and they are, and they're still doing it today. They are masters at propaganda. Yeah. It's no um, coincidence that there's been a huge societal change starting in the 60s, pretty much. That's when things started to really change. A whole paradigm uh, changed. And that's because of these things. And all of a sudden, this happens, that happens. Pretty soon, I saw things on billboards I never would have allowed before. And it just seems so innocent. It, the, he, all, the devil always works incrementally, very incrementally, until he gets into such a point where he can send the tsunami that we are dealing with now. People have so, been so desensitized to sin that the, the morality of society has just plummeted, and everybody's hurting. Everybody's groaning. And I'll get back to what I was saying. We need to think, you need to think, and so do I, and think deeply about eternity. What is it? What will it be like? We are all going there. We are all swiftly speeding there. You're going to be somewhere in eternity. Time 
is the temporary provision for this world. Time. Did, there was no time until God established the, the day and the night when he made the earth and made it habitable for man. But when this earth is done, it is almost done. Prophetically, it is almost done. And we are going to eternity, either to heaven or to hell. That's old-fashioned, isn't it? Solid and as real and as true as ever it has been. I'm looking forward to it. I'm ready. I'm happy for it. it's coming soon. I pray almost daily, come quickly. So you need to think before, you're, before it's at your door and you are undone, undone, undone with woe. We have been trained, these generations have been trained to think Twitter thoughts, to think TikTok thoughts, little fragments, short, quick, and lots of them. And I'll say it again, it has dumbed the people down, big time. And we have been affected. We're in this world. It almost seems like you can't help but using some um, things for communication, right communication. But it's not a free for all. Thank God it's not. Don't make it that way for yourself. You're hurting yourself. Because eternity. Do you ever think of people that have died? Whatever point in history, do you ever stop and think they're still thinking? Wherever they are, they're still thinking. They're still conscious. They're, evil un they're either unspeakably happy in heaven or so un woefully, unspeakably in torments in hell. And some people have been there. How long has Cain been gone? He's still reeling like it's fresh every day. You know how God says his mercies are new every morning? Isn't that a blessing? Yes. But in eternity, it's like it's just as fresh as the day he got there. It's never going to get better. It's never going to be for a season like some well, religious people believe, and then after you're there for a season, then, 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 you, then the probation's over, and then you get to get out of there. It's not like that. It's our long home, and once we cross that other side and go where we're going, we will forever, throughout all eternity, be in that place. And that's one reason people do not like to think about eternity. They do not want to think that it's true. They wish it were not true. And they try to convince themselves. And some people think they have convinced themselves. I'll just be an atheist. They'll take care of that. I always say this. I have no faith in atheism. None. Because when you're in a situation and it looks like you're about to die, oh God! Because people know in their heart of hearts, you can try to harden your conscience. But somewhere there's going to be that awakening moment, and I hope it's not too late. Think about it now. Think deep. Think long. We would do well to get into the practice of taking up a subject 
and making that our subject for the week or the month. This week, I'm going to think about eternity on my lunch break. When you're driving down to work, I'm going to think about eternity. What would that be like? What will be there? What's going to meet you when you get there? Then, think about God, who inhabits eternity. Think about God. Do you know that God has never not existed? He's always been, always will be. You could spend a lot of time thinking about that, and you will never comprehend it. You say, well, then why should I think about it? Just because of the fact that he's so great, so eternal, that you've at least got to, you've got to somehow, I don't understand it, but it's God. Listen, if you can figure out everything about God, it's not God. We will never know all about God. But we know enough to know our duty to God. And I expect that probably everyone in this room, other than little children, know enough about him to know their duty, what's required of them, of God. Is that not so? You could, you could contemplate on God for a long time because there's so much in God. His attributes, his love, his wrath, his goodness, his severity, his extreme mercy, his extreme holiness. Just like in Revelation, you get a vision of God there on the throne and what are they all saying? Same thing Isaiah heard. Holy, holy, holy. What do you think is going to strike you when that trumpet sounds and he shows up in the clouds? What do you think is going to strike you? The power of his holiness. Condemning every sinner just by his presence. You've got to take care of that sin issue now. We've got to become a partaker of his holiness now. That's what it means to be in the kingdom that we heard about this morning in Sunday school. God. Oh, Lord. Then it goes on in the latter half of this scripture. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God in his greatness is willing, desiring, longing to have people dwell with him. This is amazing. This is really amazing. And if you contemplate more about God, you'll understand why I'm saying that. It's no little thing that God wants us. Living in the time of this writing... Verse 5, saying to the idolatrous Israelites, inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. That's what they were doing. 
Did you catch that? Inflaming yourselves with idols. In other words, they were zealous, had a hot desire, a hot lust to partake in those heathen idolatries. A hot lust. There's something about it that is, and they like it. So much so that they'll turn away from the commands of God while the whole time they keep professing to be the people of God. Worst of all. Then it goes on to say, they were slaying the children. They literally did that. Ahaz the king did it. I think Manasseh did it too. And that's what some of these people were partaking of. I know of Moloch. They put the child in the open arms or however they did it. Of Moloch the idol. And there'd be a fire. They put, the, they put their babies in there. And while that baby started to scream in agony, they'd beat the drums so they wouldn't have to hear that sound. That's zeal for an idol, I would say. No wonder God laid such heavy judgments on these people. And the whole time he's sending prophets to warn them, to urge them to stop all through their history until finally he'd had enough. I am marvel at the mercy of God. Amen. And I thank God for his mercies or none of us could stand before him. Amen. Rich in mercy. And that's why he finally said, I'm done. In Jeremiah's time, to put Jeremiah in a dungeon for telling the truth. And God caused them to be taken captive by the Babylonians. And there they were for 70 years. This God, you need to come face to face with. And when you come face to face with Almighty God, it will break you. It should break you. But if you really, really do, and when you come before Him, the natural thing that follows is you see yourself. You see your sinfulness, your rebellion. You see it. It breaks you. In fact, they say, <coughs> excuse me, not the word contrition or to be contrite. It means to, like, like having a wheel drive over you and crush you to powder. Or like a hammer pounding on you, blow after blow, until you are crushed. I thought, well, that makes sense. Because that's what I went through. When God started to wake me up, and he forced me with his continual smiting, and my own sins, I was smitten by my own sins time and again. What am I doing? What have I done? That's a beautiful work, but it's really hard to go through. Because we can tend to be quite proud. And we can tend to think we're quite good. I'm a good person. Huh. You haven't seen God. Not really. But you're going to come face to face with God. And you're going to have an Isaiah moment. Woe is me. I'm undone. And you can't even face him. But in his mercy, he keeps dealing 
That's amazing. I love that. The mercy. What if he'd given up on me partway through? Because for me, it was a period of time. I didn't, this, this work didn't, wasn't there at the time. I had nobody to look to. I wasn't taught all those things growing up. It's a crisis experience. It's not just a matter of, oh, I like this church, I'll go there. Oh, I think I'll change my worldview. I think I'll be a Christian now. That's not how it works. That could be a starting point, but it's not how it works. Something takes place in our soul. It's real. And he changes us once we make that surrender. He really changes us. Glory to God, he does. <laughs> Where would we be, saints, if he hadn't changed us when he did? I can't imagine. I cannot imagine where I would have been. But his mercy brings us there. And once we get to that place, woo, then life begins. And that more abundant, the scripture says. And that's absolutely true. It's life more abundant. I feel sorry for the worldlings. You're not having more fun than me. I don't envy you. I don't miss the world. I don't miss what I used to do. They can have it, poor things. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. Aren't you glad? Almighty God wants to be with us, embrace us, not only in this life, but in the world to come all through eternity. What a hope. Amen. Why don't we comprehend it more? Amen. Why, when we sang those songs this morning, did something not go through your bodies and your spirit? Because our mind is too much on the Twitter things. Lord, bless us all. We all need. Oh, I'm, I'm glad God knows our friend. <laughs> You know, man is the crowning glory of God's creation. Did you know that? Man. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of mankind. Is the crowning glory of God's creation. That's us. That's not small. That's no little thing. That's why he paid such a high price for our redemption. And in the eternal God, and in him only, can man find his identity. It's the only way to find your own greatness. It's only in God. And it's the only way to realize, brethren, the sacred value of human life. And once we realize that, it will settle a whole lot of matters, especially in the time we're living in. Nations have abandoned biblical morality. The world, our nations have become very secularized. Teaching of evolution has reduced man to a brute beast. No soul, life has no purpose and has no value. And that's what the generations have been under for a good while now. 
that damnable, heretical, evolutionary teaching. Now, the rich elite think they're gods. And they think the rest of us are helpless, useless, nothings. It says in Psalms 113, 4, the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. And in Isaiah 40, it says, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. And I think those were gracious words to give them that much. But some feel like they're mighty powerful. <laughs> Even our own Mr. Trudeau, making decisions, overriding the people over and over again. And he just keeps on doing it. He thinks he's a powerful man. We, we could name other ones. You have Putin, you have Macron in France. You've got, how do I say his name? China's Xi Jinping? Powerful, right? Powerful. No, you're not thinking deep enough. No. What about the G20? They're a powerful group. What about the United Nations? What about NATO? What about them? What about the shadow puppeteers that are behind the scenes and they're controlling everything? Now they've got power and they've got more money. They can do whatever they want. Not quite. But we're seeing the effects of certain things before our view thanks to such like. But never think they've got the power that they think they have. We have to realize where the power is. Those dreamers, they hope to bring the demise of God in all of our societies. They're, they're working to remove, they've done a lot of it already, they're working on more to remove God, to remove any symbols of God, changing laws to make it illegal to serve God. If they don't believe in God, why are they so afraid of laws that lets us that lets us believe in someone that doesn't even exist. Just let us dream. Just let us dream. Because they're afraid. <laughs> Removing God. Do you hear laughter coming out of heaven yet? God is laughing. I'm telling you he's laughing. And laughter is infectious. Sometimes I wonder if the angels in heaven are laughing with him. You know, something about hearing somebody laugh, it just makes you laugh. Right. <laughs> Maybe we should be laughing more and say, oh, no, what's going to happen next? Yeah. But who does hold the real power? Who is God with? He's with the humble. He's with the contrite. He's with those that have received his glorious salvation, that love him evermore for it, that are very happy in it. That's who he's with. So how many people anyway does God need to take care of all this stuff down here? He doesn't need any of us. But he chooses to use us. Brethren, do we have any idea how powerful we are in God? Any idea? I think it was you, sister, this morning testifying about we can tend to feel like we're nothing. We need to think about who we are in salvation, what we have in salvation. 
Jesus said, as many, or the scripture says in John 1, as many as received them, to them he gained power. You've got power. I've got power. And it's really true. And from what I've read and what I've studied, communists, Marxism, fascism, collectivism, uh, wokeism, whatever you want to call it, it, it's all kind of the same thing. It really is. That's what's going on out there. The thing they fear is the church. It is. I've read that in different writings. And I see it in the scriptures. They're afraid of Christians. Why do you think even when COVID started with all, that's, that was kind of their step one, you know, might say in, in the public stuff they're doing. Why do you think the first thing they did was said, oh, church is closed, quick, shut up, everything. In Revelation 20, I think it's verse 9. Read it, brother, if you, quickly, whoever gets it quickly. Just Revelation 29. It's a prophecy of the end of time where we are, where the devil's already been loosed, gathering together his powers, all false systems, religion or secular. They've all gathered together. And then read what happens, brother, in Revelation 20. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Amen. All right, so this is good news. Well, the, when he came out to deceive all the nations, the first thing he did was encompass the beloved city because they were the most dangerous people and would, would be the greatest hindrance to what they wanted to accomplish on the earth. The beloved city is the church of the living God. Are we not the church of the living God? Are we not Christians indeed? That's us. If, if you're a Christian, that's you. Because there's all kinds of Christians out there. Let them be afraid. Because God's winning this war. And he's got some things in, in hand that hopefully in very soon years we're going to see happen. Those that are alive at the time are going to see you, hopefully, Brother Peter, with your own eyes. I hope he's like Simeon. He wants to be there when the Lord comes back. But this is going to happen before the Lord comes back. When the fire falls and... Well, let's read one more scripture. And I'm about done. Ezekiel 37 and 10. This is the vision of the dry bones. And through preaching, the people are raised up and brought to life. And we'll read verse 10 there, please. <clears throat> so I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Amen. That's what the preaching did. That's what the preaching's been doing. That's why God has raised up a people in this end time. And he's got an exceeding great army. The devil knows it, but sometimes we don't really grasp it. The devil is convinced of it. He's afraid of you, Sister Emily. He's afraid of you, Brother Johnny. He's afraid of you, Brother Johnny. <laughs> He is. He's afraid of every child of God if we can only grasp it. And he's going to use this. Use this. What we often feel is like, well, there's only so few of us compared to the multitudes. But God is, is our captain. Like God's on our side. He can do it with his eyes closed and, and, and whatever. <laughs> but he's going to do it. And he's going to glorify his name through his church in this end time. Amen. And he's going to send down the fire from God out of heaven in a way this world's never seen before, like an earthquake that's never been before. So great an earthquake. 
and all before that last trump sounds and he comes back. Preliminary judgment. And the kings of the earth are in for a tremendous surprise. Those, those little strange people. <laughs> they look strange. They dress strange. They talk strange. They believe strange. They laugh at us. Kings of the earth probably have had laughing parties over, at, over us. But one day's coming, and they're going to have their last laugh. And they're going to sober up so bad, they'll melt into the ground if they could. Brethren, we hold the power through God. And he wants to use his people to glorify his name. I say, God, have your way. And help us to fight everything that tries to hinder us and batter our minds and, and just enfeeble us in one way or another. God, help us in our meetings to strengthen one another and to go from strength to strength. Every one of us, in every needed way, because the devil's fighting us all, but he's not going to win. Amen. Amen. Amen.